So, Mr. President, here we are. We are having a national debate on the Senate floor about should we provide access to health care to all Americans and be able to do a way that is fiscally prudent and modernizes the way we deliver health care to emphasize value health care over volume health care. And we are having this debate even though we passed the legislation in 2010. Now, I thought when you passed a bill and it was signed into law that it was the law of the land. But no, no, here we go again. We're trying to take legislation that was passed and undo it by defunding it. I don't know what we're doing here. You know, first there was an attempt to delegitimize President Obama. Well, he's won two elections. The American people said, we want Barack Obama to be our president. When he ran the second time, we had passed the health care initiative. So that was another affirmation that, that there was public support for that bill. And now here we are on the eve of the funding for fiscal year 23 expiring, that there is a manufactured crisis bringing the government to a shut, the brink of a shutdown because the other party and a few in it are sore losers. They lost the election. They lost the battle to get the votes when they had the opportunity to vote and amend and change the Affordable Care Act. So now here we are. And I think that it is an outrageous use of the Senate's time. And we need to be able to move on with the serious business governing our country. I worry about unemployment in our country. I worry about the fact that our children are no longer achieving the best in the world. I worry about my small to mid-sized business have access to capital. I know that many here called this bill a job killer. You know what's a job killer? Our behavior here in the Senate. This gridlock, deadlock, hammerlock on the United States Senate means that we cannot do the business of the country in an orderly and predictable way. Therefore, when businesses want to plan what are going to be the rules of the game coming out of the United States government, they're not going to know. So if they're planning what they should do about their business, should they expand, what should they do? They need certainty. As long as we play brinkmanship politics, you cannot have certainty. So one thing is certain, though, that we definitely should keep the Obamacare. I'm happy to call it Obamacare because I think Obama does care, but I think all of us here who are Democrats, certainly in the Senate, and many on the other side of the aisle, also support the fact that we want to increase universal access. So let's go to what the legislation meant. When we passed the Affordable Care Act, number one, it provided access to more people for health care. When we passed that bill, 42 million Americans did not have access to health care. So that means here in the United States of America, if you needed a doctor, that doesn't mean that you would have one. If you needed a prescription drug, it doesn't mean that you could afford to buy one. In many instances, this worked hardship on many families. What also the Affordable Care Act did ended abuses of health insurance companies. When we passed that legislation, people were denied health care on the basis of a pre-existing condition. That often meant that for children in the United States of America, if they had juvenile diabetes, if they had cerebral palsy, their families couldn't get health care insurance because these children had a pre-existing condition. And if you were a woman, it was even worse that maternity, the pregnancy, was considered a pre-existing condition. That in some instances where you had had a premature birth and a C-section, you were denied health care 
because that was considered a pre-existing condition. In eight states, if you were a victim of domestic violence, you didn't, that was counted as a pre-existing condition and you couldn't have access to health care. Now, what is that? So in the Affordable Health Care Act, we changed that law. So we created the opportunities that the punitive practices of insurance companies would not be a barrier to you being able to get health insurance. Then there was this other issue of lifetime caps. That means if you had a condition and you hit a lifetime cap, then tough luck for you. Well, what happens if you have a child with hemophilia? That's a hard, hard thing for that child to face the rest of his life or her life and for the family. Don't you think there should be, an, uh, uh, there, there should be no caps on a benefit? What happens if you are struggling with cancer and you hit a cap? It doesn't mean that your need for treatment ends. It just means that your insurance company won't pay for it. Well, we lifted the annual lifetime caps. And for we women, the double insult of paying more for health insurance simply by, because we were women was repealed. In the Health Care Affordable Care Act, there is no gender discrimination. We found in our hearings that women were paid two to 10 times as much for their health insurance as men of the same age and health status. We don't think that was fair, and we changed it. We also improved health care for seniors. Number one, we added new Medicare benefits. One, free cancer screenings. Early detection means better treatment and a better chance of surviving that dreaded C word. It also provided an annual free checkup where you could go and we could get an identification of those killers, those silent killers, early on. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have high blood sugar, we found those early and could intervene before they either move to a deadly situation or worse. We know that high blood pressure, undetected, can lead to a stroke or to death. So we helped, I think, get better health care and better value for our se seniors for that. Then there is the prescription drug benefit. You know, the prescription drug benefit passed uh, called Part D, and there were something in it called the donut hole. Well, the donut hole was hard to swallow because it meant once a, senior, a senior's drug cost exceeded a certain amount, they went into not a donut hole, but a dark hole, and they had to pay for the full cost until they reached a catastrophic, a catastrophic threshold. Now, Mr. President, for many people with chronic conditions, not only those dramatic things like cancer, but a chronic condition like diabetes, you can reach that donut hole pretty quick. But that's exactly what enables you to manage your blood sugar, working with your doctor, following a program of diet, and new tr uh, diet and exercise, you still need a medication to help control that blood sugar. If you don't get that medication, you then could be heading for worse problems related to diabetic neuropathy, to vision loss, to the need for dialysis. You need to be in a program that you can follow and that you can afford. That's why closing the donut hole was so important. It saves lives, and it saves money. I could go on to other examples about what is in the Affordable Care Act. There were many advances in terms of women. There were many advances in terms of children. But I want people to know, because I'm getting a lot of vitriolic tweets uh, that somehow or another, Maryland isn't being served. Well, when I looked at the data from our own state's health commissioner, and so on. 48,000 young adults in Maryland were able to go on their parents' plans and have health insurance while they look for a job or finish their education. Also, 40, 485,000 Marylanders on Medicare were able to get that annual checkup. 
72,000 Marylanders were able to participate in the eliminating uh, of the donut hole. That saved them on the average of $700 a year, or a total of $51 million that was pumped back into the Maryland economy to do other things and create jobs for other people. So when they say they want to defund Obamacare, what is it that they then want to replace it with? Do they want to go back to big insurance and their punitive practices of denying coverage for a child with a pre-existing condition? Let them call the child the parent of a juvenile diabetic or cerebral palsy. Do they want to defend the part where young people can't stay on their parents until they're 26? Do they want to make that phone call and say, we know you're working hard to find a job or working hard to finish your education? Oh, no. Do they want to eliminate the caps on benefits? Do they want to eliminate closing the donut hole? No, they just say they want to eliminate it. Well, I want to eliminate this from the CR. So let me tell you where I come in as the chair of the full committee. I, in a very short time, the Democratic leader, the majority leader, will offer an amendment to the CR sent over by the House. I want to get rid of this brinkmanship, slam down, slap down, show down politics. The amendment that we will be offering will strike the provision to defund Obamacare. It will strike the provision uh, that was put in uh, on debt ceiling, which means the way they want to structure it, the House sent over, is we pay China first and Americans to, at the end of the line. I then want to set into motion, working with our Democrats, it's not I, we Democrats, want to have a CR. What, you're holding your finger up. I want to have an amendment, so strike oh, the defunding of Obamacare, strike the language on the debt limit, move the date for the next, the continuing resolution from December 15th to November 15th, so that we can get to a situation where we focus on completing our budget, getting an omnibus, and eliminating sequester for two years. I want to get rid of the theatrical politics and get into the real business of running, of helping govern America in a way that provides jobs, economic opportunity, and ensures our national security. Mr. President, I yield the floor.